Doug, thank you so much for being on the podcast. And I was super excited to read your book because I work in social media and it totally was exciting for me to read like another Christian talking about how to approach social in a church context, but also just as a Christian, as a believer. Um, but one of the things you mentioned early on is that you got your dissertation in social media at a seminary. And I wanted to find out from you a little bit about like what moved you in seminary to pursue mm. like a social media focus? Well, uh, one of the things I'm glad that it interested you because one of the goals is just to facilitate conversations and uh, the way we apply things might go in all kinds of different directions. Uh, so I had been working on a doctorate of ministry for a long time. I actually worked at one institution, got a bunch of credits, but did not want to do the project. And one of the reasons I didn't want to do the project is I just didn't find it relevant. Uh, I thought if I do whatever they want me to do here, it's just going to be a degree, <laughs> but it's not going to have much relevance. And I don't want to just do that. I actually wanted to do something that matters. So I put that aside. And then actually I was uh, in radio for five years. And when I transitioned out of that, I felt like the Lord called me back into education and uh, Portland Seminary, uh, which is associated with George Fox University. They just worked with me. They saw my heart. They saw that I had already lots of the prerequisites and I told them what I wanted to do. I said, I'm, I've, you know, being in radio, I've seen this divided, devouring spirit. We're becoming more polarized. And now I'm seeing a technology online. We're all becoming like these talk show hosts online. And so uh, they let me form my, my doctorate out of my passions. The interesting thing, though, is with education, and I encourage anyone in education with this, is I thought I knew the answer. I thought, OK, give me time to research and you know, come up with the answer that I already know is there. Uh, I just thought, you know, Christians, we've forgotten to be reconciling online. And so we need to be reconciling and, and be good Christians online. What I didn't realize is how much the technology is really forming us and influencing mm. us. And so I think that's probably one of the unique aspects of the book. It's not just a pastor talking about good things we do, but I've tried to build uh, my advocacy on research and not, quote unquote, Christian research, just research of what technology is doing to us. And technology is tre tremendous in the sense that the social media, internet communication can do amazing things. However, it is also exaggerating some of the worst aspects of <laughs> human identity as well. So that's, that's kind of, I focus my dissertation on the technology aspect and the research part. And then from all that stuff, which I'd learned so much, I thought I want to write something a little bit more practical because no one wants to read a dissertation in general. <laughs> so I, I, I wrote some practical things because I really was changed in the process. I, I became an advocate of what I learned. And that's, I think that's a great part of getting an education at any level. And I wanted to share it with people uh, who might not know or have, may not have discovered what I discovered. It's a super fascinating thesis, like how technology is shaping us. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about like some of those ways that we're impacted by social media and maybe some of the ways that we don't even realize. Yeah. And this is a part that Christians, I think we get a little naive. We'll say things like, well, you know, the gospel is the same no matter where we proclaim it. But I get that. The gospel is the same. But uh, a technological theorist, Marshall McLuhan, said, the medium is the message. He said this in the mid-1970s, the medium is the message. And the first time you hear that, you're like, what does that even mean? But what he's saying is every medium, and a medium could be radio, the printing press is a medium, television, and he's talking more in the television age, uh, every medium doesn't just communicate what we want to communicate in a different medium, it actually changes the message as we communicate it. It changes the message. It changes the messengers. Mm. It changes who we are, what parts of us we present, what parts of us we hold back. And so if a medium takes over culture, like if everyone is watching TV and we're communicating all our ideas through TV, the way we communicate through television changes how we abide together. And there was many you know, studies on that with the television age, and we're kind of in this transitional point where... Uh, certainly home screens are still a part of our life. But now when it comes to social media, it is changing us. It's changing what we communicate, why we communicate, and how we communicate. And it's not just that people are becoming meaner and just evil and they were nice in the past and they're just worse now. I believe that at some level, humans have always been humans, whatever age it's been. But this technology is bringing out some of the most divisive, dehumanizing aspects of our behavior. 
and 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 just one area we can certainly get into those things but uh the reality of empathy like you and i are doing a recording where i can see your face and this might seem so simple but if you exaggerate this with millions of conversations every day you can see the problem of this if i see your face and i say something that offends you or hurts you I can immediately tell without you saying any words. Even if you try to hide it, usually humans can tell that. You can tell something's wrong. This person has gotten quiet. They're no longer shaking their head in agreement, you know, whatever it is. From that emotional connection, that is a visual connection, I become empathetic. Our empathy rises up in me, that part of the human that says, I don't want to hurt someone and I don't want to just communicate to communicate. Uh, so online, those visual cues are gone. They've done studies even that generationally from generation X on, we're becoming less empathetic because we're spending more time looking at screens mm. than we are actually looking people in the face. And so when I'm online and I'm arguing with you and everybody knows we do this, if somebody says something offensive to us, if we're trying to visualize that person at all, we tend to visualize them as angry faced or mad or full of scorn. That alone changes how we respond to someone first responding to a tweet that seems not, not like a big deal. That's a huge thing. Because if, if someone is just asking a question and they're like, oh, I never thought of that. Well, tell me why the church is important. Well, if I think this person is attacking the church and I don't see their face, I feel like they're going, tell me why the church is important. And they're trying to make me justify it. Totally. My next response is going to be, different based on that lack of a facial cue. That's just one area. And I go through all kinds of areas, the concept of written communication. This, you know, this is true, right? On Facebook, when people start fighting, the posts get longer and longer. Have you noticed that? Like at least theologically, right? Yeah. Big, long treatises, right? <laughs> and you just go, oh, stay away from this thing. It's two guys, right? Two guys going back and forth all day long with their, they're writing literally a book on <laughs> right. Facebook, right? So here's the problem, though, with written communication. It, our brains tend to only use one aspect, uh, or at least written communication fires in only certain aspects of our brain. And I don't want to be too simplistic with left brain and right brain, but in general, there's an agreement that only some parts of our brain are really used when we start reading and writing. Mm -hmm. However, the parts of problem solving, of seeing things in a big picture, of um, uh, this, this other world are in different parts of our brain. And so what we're doing is we're, we're arguing about some of the most important issues of our day, but we're only using part of our brain, mm. the problem solving part of our brain, the visual cue part of our brain, just other aspects. We're limiting our capacity online and yet we're making some of our most important discussions and decisions online. That's a problem. And that's again, something that makes us more polarized. Uh, I should obviously let you ask questions as well, but as you <laughs> can see, so good. I'm very excited about this and I could just go on and on. I love this. No, um, this actually happened to me yesterday. I got an email and my the way that I read it, Doug, was hypercritical of some work that I was doing. And and I'm highly, I know I'm very sensitive. Like my wife tells me, you're too sensitive. I, I know I'm sensitive. And so if I get any sort of hint of negativity through any sort of written communication, email or social media. And like you just pointed out, when you don't know facial cues or background on the question, like, is it a serious, thoughtful question? Is it a criticism? Because I'm so sensitive, I can take it the wrong way. And so uh, my, my initial reaction was to um, not send my thoughts, but just write out how I was feeling, how, what I'd want to say. Um, and then I composed myself and wrote something that was um, nice and, and kind of trying to get clarification. But like, how can we well, like, you, you, I'm sorry, but you got at that, that like, I literally in our church, I, whether people follow this rule, you know how this is I, a pastor, I can make an edict, whether anyone follows it. But I say, we don't use email to talk about difficult, uh, complicated conflict things, conflict oriented because of those things, like unless we can't, unless there's no other way we can talk to this person that at best at first in person, if not in person, but especially in the COVID age, right? Uh, at least where we can hear their voice and we can have a conversation because that's exactly what happens. We don't have a font, you know, that shows sarcasm. We don't have a font that shows anger or a font that shows, I'm not trying to get upset at you. I'm just communicating this. And this is just a practical principle for people. 
If online you feel like someone might be attacking you, someone might be saying something that they are, because people can be passive aggressive too. So you're trying to read into this thing. The first response, ask for clarity. And, and it can be as simple as, I don't quite understand what you're saying. Could you explain that more? And just by that alone, you can often tell the difference between someone who's just sharing something and maybe not the most eloquent way, because not everyone is a great writer online. We shouldn't assume that they know how to communicate their thoughts through written language. And then R, you'll be able to tell, ah, they're actually going after me and this is a, an attack. But I've found, I don't know if you've ever done that, where I've responded to someone because I don't know a, a tweet or something. And then I responded very defensively and they're like, oh, no, no, I didn't mean that about you. And, <laughs> yes. and then you feel like, oh boy, what am I doing here? You know? So at least while I have a book called Posting Peace, I definitely have to do that the first time. Like I gotta, I gotta, but that's a practical thing because you could just assume if you're ever feeling anxious, emotional, angry, don't respond based on an immediate, I'm going to get you back. Just broaden it out a little bit and say, can you explain more what that means? Or if you kind of know the topic, say, can you tell me what you mean by I'm being unapproachable or just anything like that? And then you'll see the intent. If they're just trying to hurt you and they're angry and they're mean, or if they're in an you know ineloquent way trying to express something through a medium that has a lot of limitations. And if the person is truly hypercritical uh, in a hurtful way, like they're just trying to draw you out and you start to get that sense, how should we respond in those situations? Mm. Well, by the way, I just thought of this. You know, some people will do trolling behaviors through asking questions. And, you know, they don't care about your questions. It's just a way for them not to argue. It's a passive aggressive arguing. It's a, but do you think women should do this? And do you think that? And you just know that they want you to say something and then they can call you a fool. And they're just doing those leading questions. Uh, th this concept, I think, and I have a chapter on this on trolling. Uh, but the idea for me is, again, trolling sometimes are we don't know what this is coming from, this angry response. It can be someone who's just searching the Internet to get in fights with people. It could be someone else, though, who has a profound hurt based mm -hmm. on a past experience and they're projecting it on you. And as a pastor, I've experienced that if someone's been hurt by other pastors or multiple pastors, they're probably probably going to see me as a threat or the enemy or as those pastors until I prove myself otherwise. And so this is an area where I've, um, well, like, here's even an example. I often advocate for uh, truth and love, but I, I say, you know, it, we can't, you know, speak truth if people don't know that we, we love them. Now, some people have been raised in abusive environments where they were taught that love was not talking about sin in that church. Love is just not talking about the fact that the pastor is a narcissist and they're harming people in the church. Let's just not talk about that. We're going to be loving. And loving is just overlooking and not talking about those things. So when I say something like being loving, they think that's what I'm saying. They think I'm saying hide abuse, hide narcissism, mm -hmm. hide justice. That's not what I'm saying. But their first response can be an attack in the sense that they'll say something really negative to me. I have to communicate or ask a question or do something to, to differentiate myself from what they think that is. And you'll find that if I can say, no, I, oh, I agree as well, that any way I can agree with their, you know, I agree too, that justice, a part of love is confronting sin. A part of love is creating boundaries. A part of love is not allowing abusers to, to abuse other people. Then that changes the dialogue. Now you'll find with that, someone will either be more conciliatory and come closer. And now we have a connection and they, that anger and all that stuff dies down or they just keep going at me. And I know they're just angry or mad or just want to fight. And it doesn't matter what I'm going to say. I found that to be a huge case to, to risk one. It's wasn't that turning the other cheek almost. It's like, okay, mm. you just struck me on the face. I'm going to see what this is about. And then I can write, Hey, I got nothing against you. I'm fine. I'm, thanks for sharing your opinion. And then you can see a de-escalation. Oh, I'm sorry. I just, you know, was hurt by the church mm -hmm. and I'm upset with people. And then you have a great conversation. <laughs> However, if you say something conciliatory and they come back at you even harder, I've had people block me for loving them. Like I just keep saying nice things mm -hmm. to them and they get so mad. They're like, I want to fight with you. I don't, I don't, I don't want to reconcile. I don't want to come to an agreement. I want you to be the enemy. And it's, the, it's, I shouldn't laugh. It's so sad, but literally I have nothing against them. I'm writing things of encouragement. And finally they're like enough with you. And, 
and they'll mute you because it's an, I don't know, an angry atheist or an angry, hurt ex-evangelical or... So, yeah, I think that's relational, how we deal with people harming us. Uh, we can certainly create boundaries. We don't have to be you know, stepped on just for the sake of people sinning against us. In fact, it's grace to not let someone continue to sin against you, to say, hey, this is harming you by you sinning against me. I'm going to mute you. <laughs> I'm going to hand you over to your devices. But no this, that I don't have anything against you, except for I'm really sorry that you're going online just to argue with people and hurt people. I love how much empathy you just expressed there. And I definitely saw it in reading your book, just how much care you have, how much empathy you have as you talked about social media. And what you just said takes a lot of self-awareness. Like you just said, like this person might have been hurt by a pastor, hurt by a church. And now I'm now the target because they're taking that pain uh, on you. And you are kind of, okay, how do I best respond to this person? I'm curious, like, when you are getting this negativity, like you just described in your mind, like the different questions you have about where is this coming from? I need more context. But for those of us who maybe struggle with being self-aware, who struggle with having empathy, especially in these moments when you feel attacked, and you want to defend yourself and you just like want to just respond back quickly to protect your identity. What are ways that we can begin to do an internal check mm. to be, to have more empathy? These are great questions. And um, I wrote posting peace, not as another law for people to fail at. It's not, here's the 10 ways you respond to someone, because as I think you're addressing there, people are so different our emotional makeup, our intellectual ways of processing, that I'd be sinning against people to say, oh, just do it the way I do it. Uh, and a lot of the ways I do it come from my own emotional needs. And I, I talk about that. I am a very emotional person. I'm a middle child. I don't like conflict. And so even my motivations sometimes might not be the best on why I'm trying to read the situation. I just don't want to be hurt. <laughs> I, I don't, I take things personally. So I'm trying to find out how not to be hurt. But the first thing, and this is one of the primary, just simple advocacies in posting peace, but it's legitimately something we must have in mind if we're going to process conflict, is the goal of our existence. Uh, Paul said that God has entrusted us with the ministry of reconciliation. And again, that's not just about race reconciliation, although that's certainly within that. Uh, reconciliation is just what? That that. Jesus, through the cross, brought us closer to the Father. He, he removed sin. Uh, he removed death. He, and he brought us closer. That's reconciliation. The simple message of that we've been brought close to God through Jesus Christ. And then also there's the reconciliation between one and another. And that's the ministry as well, to tear down every dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile, uh, between you and me between races, between ethnicities, between uh, differing groups, that our goal is so that I, I want someone to experience the love of God, to know that God loves them and God desires a relationship with them. And I want them to know that I want as best of a relationship as possible between us. We might not be best friends, but I want this one interaction online to be a reconciling interaction where I make room for God to speak into your life. And I make room for you to know that I'm someone for you, for God's purposes in your life, not against you. Now, that's important because when you start thinking that way, then you start looking at conflict in a different way. So you mentioned that I think about all these, I'm trying to figure out why is this person doing this? Well, why am I trying to figure out why this person is doing this? Because my ministry is reconciliation. Mm. So if I meet someone who's angry and they're angry at God, and my goal in this interaction is for them to experience the love of God, what am I going to do? I'm going to see, well, hmm, why are they angry? Where are they hurt? Uh, where can they experience the love of God? Will a person who's been attacked by pastors who preach strong, authoritative messages, are they going to find God by me preaching another strong, authoritative message? And does it even matter what the content of that message is? Probably not. They just don't trust me and they don't trust God. So for someone like that, 
I'm not going to spend a bunch of time preaching to them. I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to listen. I'm going to say thank you for sharing that. I'm just going to be someone who's not angry and authoritative and judgmental and rejects them if they don't have the right ideology or theology. But why did I think in those terms? Because my goal is to make room for God to be expressed in their life and for them to know that I'm someone who's for them, not against them. And then that can happen in so many different areas. Now, I might express it differently than you do, but I want to stand before the Lord and say that was my motivation. Mm. And I think even over the long haul, some people will understand this. With the people we love, when we know they're trying, it matters. Even if they're trying poorly, even if they don't really understand the situation, if at some level they know this person's trying to help me, they're not helping me. We've all had that. We've all had friends who tried to understand what we're going through, and they didn't. But you weren't, like, hostile towards them. You might be like, yeah, that didn't really help. But at least we can do that. At least. Now, some people might, regardless of how we try, they might still reject us. But then we can at least stand before the Lord and say, this was my attempt. This is how you made me. Like, for people who are not very verbal, this is how you made me. I can't write along and treat us, but I said, thank you for sharing. And anytime you want to share, I'm here to listen. And they might've got upset with that, but I did that because I genuinely am trying to facilitate the ministry of reconciliation. So that to me is, I can't judge what you're doing, but I can ask you these questions. I can say, was that your motivation? Is your motivation to make room for God in this situation? Or did you just get lost in trying to win an argument? the issue of being right versus reconciling. Mm -hmm. And we have to be reminded of that on a daily basis because we all forget it. In our closest relationships, when do you start fighting with your... Have you ever gotten a fight with someone you love and you're just fighting over the issues and you're and they say their point, you say your point, and you, you know what? You can't even solve that relationship until you just stop with all the animosity and you say, you know what, regardless, I love you and I'm sorry that I've been yelling or I'm sorry that I'm so angry. I don't want to be this way. God can help us. That's a healthy marriage, right? And then when you allow the spirit of God to influence the marriage, then you can talk about the issues. Well, it's not a marriage online, but the same principle is true. If you don't have that heart in the right place, it doesn't matter what truth you communicate. And in fact, it's very dangerous because you might be c communicating right things for the wrong reasons. Mm. And that's some of the most wickedness in the world. People with the right words, but the wrong motivations for why they're sharing this. Oh, that is so powerful and so beautiful. Um, and it just, as you were talking, I was thinking about just this last week, I was, I got into an argument with my wife and it was back and forth. And my daughter, who's 15, was right there listening because she loves hearing <laughs> how we argue. And I'm like, sweetie, isn't there something better for you to do? She's like, no, I like hearing how you and mom, and actually it's good having like a referee because she's kind of like just kind of observing. And and so I was like sharing like my, my viewpoint in totally the wrong tone. Like, and I didn't even realize it. Like I was saying something and my what my daughter called me out on it. It's like, dad, the way you just said that is totally hurtful. And I was like, what? I just said the right, I just said something that was totally right. objective, but the way that it came across my tone sounded sarcastic. It sounded rude. And mm. I didn't hear it. I was expressing that my daughter heard it and called me out on it. And I was like, oh my gosh, like if she wasn't there, I wouldn't even know. By the way, that is so good. And you're modeling something that some homes don't have that safety. And I'm so glad you shared that because I would say to all our kids, you have authority to speak into our life. And they're also believers as well. And I'm like, if you see me doing something that is sinning against anyone else or are harmful or you just don't think is right, you can interrupt us. You can interrupt us mid fight. You can interrupt us wherever we're at. And you and, and that's hard. I said that, but that's hard because if you're in a defensive place and then you're one of your daughters says something and you're like, well, she doesn't understand. And you respond, honey, you know, I, you just don't. And then the next daughter says the same thing to you. Then suddenly, <laughs> yeah. suddenly you realize you're like, uh oh. Uh, whatever I think is going on. It's, I think it was Charles Kraft who said, uh, communication is receptor oriented. And that's a big phrase, but it basically means it doesn't matter what I think I'm communicating. It's what people receive. And we have that much, that much disconnect. 
where we can be delusional in the sense of I'm being loving and kind and caring. But if the people in the room are seeing someone who's sounding condescending or smug or just on the offensive, you know, uh, that matters because it's not what I supposedly intended. It's what people received. And if they give me feedback that what I intended is not coming through, then if I love them, I'm going to change things so that they can understand it in the way I intended. That's true in a personal relationship. And look how hard that is when everyone's in the room. When they're outside the room, it's even more hard. And it's especially hard if you don't value the relationship. Why do you reconcile with your wife and your kids? Mm. Is You're going to be with each other the rest of your life. You don't just go, well, you're wrong. I'm right. See you later. Sadly, online, how many of our relationships are becoming like that? It's, I will only love you as much as you defend what I'm doing and agree mm. with me. And if anyone attacks me at any level, I'm just going to leave you by the wayside. And I'm going to go find some other stranger that either fully agrees with me or that I can reject after a few interactions. I know that's an extreme statement, but if we look at it, some of us are behaving in those ways. Yeah. No doubt. And like I said, that happened to me. I, I just totally sinned against my wife. My daughter called me out. She's like the little Holy Spirit there. Um, I was very, very important to have her there um, calling that out on me. Um, and, and I use, by the way, I use sinned against. I'm glad you brought because some people, they struggle even with the concept of sin. Um, we are loved by God. We're in the center of God's grace. And if you believe you're in the center of God's grace, that means we're not like hanging on the edge and if we do one wrong thing, God's like, well, you're out of here. You're no longer my son or my daughter. The, the cross is that God, as we were enemies, died for us, loved us, and placed us in the center of his love and his grace. That's what salvation is. We are in the center of that. And when you are there, then you can say, search my heart, Lord, and know my ways. And any revelation of sin, like if I tell someone you are sinning against someone, I'm not trying to make them feel bad. That's something where you feel good. Oh, God revealed a sin, like whether it was a sin that I meant to do or not to do. And it's not so I can feel bad. It's so I can realize, wow, this really does work. The Holy Spirit is moving in our life. I'm being conformed to the image of Christ while I'm in the center of God's grace. And that's the same thing with the social media stuff. If you're trying to defend your worth by every action, you're not going to like this book. If you think you're righteous because you do everything right, you're not going to like this book. Because I don't believe you're doing everything right. I don't believe I'm doing everything right. But I believe the journey of a Christian is to search my heart and search my mind, my ways. And because you love me, conform me to your image. And if I am not imaging Christ online, then I'm not living in the fullness of the freedom for which you set me free. I'm not expressing the salvation that I abide in. And so, yes, it's okay to say that that's sinning against someone. And so we repent. We ask the Lord to show us the right direction. And we recognize that we might do it tomorrow as well. Uh, but that the cross forgives yesterday, today, and in the future as well. That's the power of the cross. So we don't have to be afraid. So I really want people to read this book with an open heart to say, I got room to grow. And if they do, I know they'll grow because I knew I grew in the process and I thought I was doing it pretty well. <laughs> so wherever you're at, you're going to grow. And he said something really powerful too, which is like, you can say the right thing, but it can be messaged in a way that is hurtful. And that's, I think that's sometimes it's really hard because we, we get a critique um, or even we're commenting on an issue that we feel passionate about, a societal issue, a social justice issue, and we draft something that we feel is right and biblical, and we go out with that message on social, and but it can come across as just in the wrong way. It could become across as hurtful, no matter your intention. And I'm wondering like, how do how do you approach like those topics where we feel like I need to talk about this issue and I need to take my stance? Well, the, the issue again is why am I doing this? And uh, I know for me, I want people to like me. And that's not always a good motivation. Or I don't want them not to like me, right? But that's not what love is. Love is really, I just am called to love you. And for instance, you know, race relations. Let's say you have a strong sense of there's injustices that are being done against our, our black brothers and sisters. Uh, systemic injustices, personal injustices. 
So you try to become an advocate or an ally, right? And you, you communicate something. But the goal needs to be, I'm not doing this so that people can say, wow, Doug, you are really an enlightened person. It's not to, the term they use is center. I'm not trying to center myself. And some people don't realize this. And this is where they get offended. But if I'm upset, like if I write something to a, a black friend of mine, and instead of them going, oh, Doug, you understand so well, and thank you for writing that, I get maybe a pushback. I get someone critiquing the way I expressed it. And then immediately defensiveness rises up. Like, how could you attack me as a racist? Because I'm advocating and I didn't even have to do this. And like, if you start looking at why you're upset, it's almost all because you were doing this for your own personal needs to be met. But if my goal was genuinely to show someone that I love them, then I'm going to let them process it all. But even if they were wrong, like I'm people, well, you understand I was right. Okay, fine. This person's hurt. Are they mad or whatever they are? Your goal was to love them. And if the Bible says love your enemies, then you can love a brother or sister who's been hurt, who might even be taking some of that hurt out on you. I found in ministry that often you become a representative of Jesus. And people want to see if God's love is true or not. So they'll push that. They'll actually do things that are a little bit more offensive and aggressive because they want to know if this grace thing and this love thing is true. But if I'm trying to contend for my worth and my value and my respect, then the moment someone gets upset with my the good thing I said, then I'm going to go after them. And I'm going to now turn this relationship into something that feeds my ego. I talk about this as a larger concept, the concept of networked individualism. And uh, there's two scholars, Rainey and Wellman, who talk about the internet is great for networked individualism. And they say this all in positive terms, but they basically say any individualistic need you have, you can find a network of people to meet it. And that really is a strength of the internet. If I've been sinned against by the church, I can find other people who were sinned against and they get it. And I can connect with them. There's whole hashtags like called church too. And, and although the ex-evangelical is a whole group of people, um, there are some people who have been hurt by the evangelical church or hurt by the Catholic church. Or, I mean, there's all kinds of groups. And they can unite around that need for that hurt to be understood, for their advocacy to be partnered with. Um, but the problem with just uniting around our individual needs is we don't develop into more holistic people. Uh, and I'm seeing this, that those are big issues, but some people like, I just, you got to have my politics and I'm satisfied when people say what I believe. And so they just isolate themselves with people who believe what they believe, or they have the same theology that they have. And then we only exist in those communities as much as people agree with us. And that's an individualistic thing. It's, it's, I'm talking about my politics so that I can find other people who agree with my politics to confirm who I am and to meet my individualistic needs. The moment I confront someone who has different politics or even within my political party has a different view than I have, I see it as a threat to my individualism. I immediately fight with them, block them, mute them, disappear. That's a big problem. If my goal is just for my individual needs to be met, the moment I face conflict, I'm just going to go into the defensive mode, the protection mode, or the attack mode. If I believe my goal is to build community, to express the love and light of Christ, to shine truth in dark areas, to be able to communicate in ways that bring, bring people from a lie into the truth, then when I face conflict, I'm going to say, ah, now it's an opportunity for me to do the ministry of reconciliation, to show this person how much I love them, to show this person how much God loves them, to actually communicate in a way that contrasts the rest of the world. And Christians are missing that. So it, it, it the concept at the very beginning, you said this, where people can communicate the right words for the wrong reasons. I see that politically, like you could have, let's say, and I'm not going to bring up what an issue is, but the, the right view of immigration or the right view of gun control. And, or at least I think you have it, maybe others don't. But if you're communicating that to divide people, if you're communicating that to win points and score points with people who agree with you, if you're communicating that in such a way that you're trying to literally, we, we want to win and you lose, we stay in this country, you get kicked out, that is not a reconciling intent. And we have to be that discerning. Well, I was just right. And my truth does, you know, a truth doesn't care about your feelings. No, that's not true. Truth is Jesus. And Jesus very much cares about mm -hmm. our feelings. He very much cares about 
how we receive truth, even if it does hurt our feelings. So those motivations, again, I keep coming back to that. And some people, I know even the critique of the book, they're like, well, give me the practical things. And I do have things that you can actually do. But I know this about sin and legalism is you can check all the boxes and you can look like you're doing a good job and you can have the right curriculum and you can have wicked motivations. That's the struggle of actually the sins that we see in the church. So for me, I'm going at the motivation of someone's heart because we do lose sight of that. If you lose sight of it in a marriage where you're just upset and you're just trying to win the argument and then the Lord's like, what are you doing, Doug? You love this woman and you're just out of control. You're just upset and trying to win a point and who's right or who's wrong. But I don't care if you're right, Doug. Your attitude, your spirit, your motivation is wrong. That is not love. So God gets a hold of your heart. Well, he's got to get a hold of our heart and our online communication as well, uh, because strangers God cares about just as much as he cares about the people closest to us in our life. Well, I got to say, Doug, you totally challenged me as I was reading your book. And like the chapter you just mentioned about networked individualism, your section where you talked about the echo chamber, like hit me hard. And it, it, and I started to rethink, like I looked at my Twitter, my Twitter follower, like who I'm following. And my and my Twitter lists, and I and I was like thinking about oh Doug just pointed out echo chambers and how I gravitate and I do I gravitate towards those Twitter lists that I tend to agree with whether it's uh, from a religious perspective or a um, political perspective like that's where I gravitate and like you challenged me and I was like oh Doug is so right like I need to be self aware of the echo chambers that I'm feeding myself yeah. Well, one, we know the technology already segments us. We, we, it'll say, if you follow this person, follow that person. And so we can find like-minded people. And there's nothing wrong with that unless that's all we're hanging out with, which we, you know, even in person, Christians who are, I have my Christian church, my Christian music, I live in my Christian community, and I wait for Christ to return. I think that's a terrible way to live your life. I think at some level, regardless of the people around you who love Christ, the purpose of that is to strengthen us to reach the people who don't know Jesus. And I even think probably for our social media advocacy, depending upon your mental health, your own emotional makeup, you do need a certain amount of people that feed your soul. You, you do need a, a, a group of those people. But then you need to look, am I just with those people? Or do I also have some diversity of different people? And now some can even be more toxic where... It's not about that people don't feed our soul. It's just because we're white, we hang around with white people and because we're such a segregated culture. And so we need to intentionally begin to follow people who don't look like us. And it's not because, oh, that looks like the woke thing to do. It's because that's what the body of Christ looks like. That's what God sees. To be relevant is to see what God sees. And so then you look and you go, you know, I'm just hanging out with middle-class white guys online. And one of the strengths of being online is that you can connect with anyone. So I'm going to intentionally have more women that I follow. I'm going to have intentionally people of different ethnicities. Uh, I'm also politically, I realize I'm just kind of hanging out with certain people. Now, I don't want to necessarily maybe hang out with harmful, toxic people that just destroy my soul. But maybe there's some people who disagree with me that I could have some genuine conversations or at least know where they're coming from. That's, you know, I have a little thing where I ask people to look over who they're following and, and what they're tweeting about and what they're posting about. And does it reflect a, a, just a group of people you've segmented with, you know, preaching to the choir, they call it? Or are you actually expanding your horizon where people could say, yeah, you kind of have a healthy group of people. And not just so you can look good to other people, but so you genuinely can see the world as it is. And you can generally, as much as you can, influence the larger world and people who already agree with you. The, the other um, the other chapter that hit me hard and actually took a picture of it and sent it to my work colleagues was a chapter you dealt with trolling behavior and how we can be so, what you said, dehumanizing when we start to call people trolls. And that hit me. And I want, I wonder if you can kind of unpack that because you displayed so much empathy in that chapter. Like I said, I, I took a picture and I sent it to my team. Like we have to rethink how we're naming people. 
This this will probably be, I think, the most controversial or where people will get defensive. The fact that I say this statement, I say that I do not call people trolls. And um, I, this is a bigger if you if you read the book, you understand this context. Are you a bad person if you call people trolls? No, I'm, I'm not trying to say that. But I wanted to give a philosophy that people would would struggle with a little bit. I'm not just trying to police language. But I wanted to talk about the power of language. And again, we need to know the power of language. We know the word troll, you know, people say, where does that come from? You know, probably originally came from when you're fishing and you pull a lure behind. And the goal is just you do something that that the fish see and they're like, ah, I'm going to get that. You find a way to get them to bite at something. And so trolling in the beginning would be just the concept of getting someone to bite at something, even that you know is ridiculous, to get people upset, to go into a Star Wars forum and talk about Star Trek, you know, just something that just makes people really upset to say something you know that's not true and everybody gets upset. So that can be very mild and, and just kind of like prankster stuff. Uh, however, it turned into some really toxic things where people would troll, they would go to a 9-11 memorial site, and they would say something positive about uh, the people who are flying the plane or hijacking. You know, something they knew would get everyone really upset. And they didn't care about the topic. They don't even care about what they're saying. Their goal is just to cause chaos and to get some joy out of making other people miserable. Well, then trolling then eventually turned to something that now this is what we call it is just someone who's angry at everybody and fighting with them and trying to get in fights. And now we see it more like the troll under the bridge, right? When someone says troll now, it's this, you know, this troll who's just, you know, less than human. And so what I said in the book is I don't use the word troll because when you use the word troll, you're feeding into that trolling behavior. Trolling behavior dehumanizes. The goal is I don't care about you. The goal is I don't care about your emotional life. I don't care about what you believe. I just want to do whatever I can to make you upset. I just enjoy fighting with you. Uh, it's a dehumanizing thing because if you treat any human where you don't care about them, by definition, that's dehumanizing. To use the word troll is dehumanizing as well because a troll is not a human. And that's what we're doing. We're saying this person, and I know we'd say, well, I'm not saying that, but it's kind of what we are doing. We're saying this person is less than human. This person is just so bad, they're just a troll under the bridge. And once you make someone in another category, then you can discard them. Then you can give up on them. And I told a story in the book, it's true of anything like monster. Like when we see something terrible happen, murders, rapes, horrible thing, monstrous things. We sometimes want to just say that person is a monster. But the reason we say that sometimes is to distance ourselves from it, to say mm. that could never happen to me or in me. I would never do something so monstrous. It's another way to dehumanize someone in order to say that that's not in me. Well, my, da my dad would say things to me as a kid, and he would say, you know, if we really want to understand sin, uh, it's one thing to understand how it's sinful in that person. It's another thing to see where that sin expresses itself in you, because that's true maturity, to be able to see that. And uh, I remember talking to him about Nazis and concentration camps, and I tell a story on this, and just just seeing all that and just how terrible it is. And my dad, of course, like anyone should, said, that is terrible. It's monstrous. It's inhumane. It's hard to believe that that could ever happen, the concentration camps, but it did happen. But my dad said to me, you can't just say, oh, those people were monsters and just different than us. That's the same dehumanizing. To dehumanize the Jews would be to say they're not real people, and so we can put them in concentration camps. Well, it's dehumanizing to say, oh, and the Nazis are not real people either. They're just monsters. The reality is those were all humans and humans who made choices or didn't have any choices to make. And we must recognize that the same wickedness or the potential for wickedness that we see in the most dehumanizing things, such as concentration camps, is a potential in us. That we have the potential to such wickedness, the potential to such dehumanizing behavior. And I know this is like, oh, Doug, I'm just using the word troll. Don't compare me to a Nazi. Like, no, I'm not doing that. But I am saying when someone is trolling, doing that behavior, I want to make sure that I still see a human being. Even if that's just under the Lord, that for whatever reason, this human is so far gone and I might not be able to do anything to stop them from harming other people, but I can at least acknowledge the fact that they were created in the image of God 
and they have chosen to use that image to destroy God's creation instead of to be a steward of God's creation. So that's important to me. When someone is trolling against me, I don't want to find ways to dehumanize them. When they dehumanize, I humanize. That's the goal. Like when, when they, does it work? Do they change? Do they suddenly go, oh, thank you. I, I'm going to stop trolling anymore. But I, I think at some level I have to trust that at least they're accountable. And they can't say I didn't love them. They can't say that God didn't love them. But they chose, chose as Paul says in, I think it's Romans, they, they're suppressing the knowledge of God. They're suppressing what God is doing. And they're choosing to reject it and to retaliate and to attack. But you have to ask yourself, because uh, Jesus says, love your enemies, right? If you love your enemies, you can love your trolls, right? If <laughs> You can love someone like that, right? Enemies a category. So even if you use the word troll, and that's fine for you, as you use it, are you loving that person so that we can see the human? Or are you just making them more grotesque and saying, go back under that bridge and leave us alone? Mm. Well, Doug, I want to thank you so much for writing such a powerful book that challenges us, that forces us to think about how we can display more empathy, how we can be more compassionate, more loving, and seek reconciliation. Like you've, you've uh, provided so much great insight and also practical tips and also reshaped my own thinking about these things. So I want to thank you for doing that. For those that want to learn more about your book and also follow you on social mm -hmm. media, what's the best way for them to do that? First, thank you for these gracious words. And it's so nice to do an interview with someone that I know has actually engaged the material. And uh, you've, you've you know, brought stuff up in me that's not even in the book that I just enjoy talking about these things. Um, I want to encourage people. The book's Posting Peace, Why Social Media Divides Us and What We Can Do About It. And uh, you can go to postingpeace.com and it'll get you to my website. The website's fairlyspiritual.org. But they all go to the same place. I focus them in the same place. So you go to postingpeace.com and it'll bring you there. And then uh, on social media, my handle is fairly spiritual. And uh, I just post about everything there. Don't expect uh, grand things. It's I, from the mundane to the silly to the stupid to uh, it's just me. It's just me communicating any thought that comes to my head uh, online. I do want to interact with anyone. Uh, so use the posting piece hashtag and I'll look at those posting piece hashtags and I'll interact with you as you go through the book. Awesome. Well, I, I've been enjoying your tweets and um, I want to encourage everyone to make sure you're following at Fairly Spiritual. Uh, Doug, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me on and all the best to you. Hey, thank you so much for checking out this video clip from the Dogato podcast. To get more videos like this, simply subscribe here on YouTube. You can also download the full episode of each show on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or your favorite podcast player. Take care.